and you got to let me know what you decide to do, by the way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> try I will. Pitch I'll keep you posted. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. Thanks so for your help with that. Oh, sure. Of course. Um, all right. So I've stopped my video and here I am just audio. Hello. Uh, so my very first question to you is what inspires you about Star Trek? What inspires me about Star Trek, I think, is mostly the idea that there is a future that isn't dark and dire. And while there are challenges that we face and complications and, and obstacles that we've kind of evolved as a not just a singular species and that there are other species obviously is very cool but this this idea that we can do better and strive for more and uh just a sense of optimism and uh which was a great counterbalance i think there's a lot of really dark stories out there post-apocalyptic narratives and i didn't know that when i first got into star trek but it really resonated with me as a kid this idea that we'd get our 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 stuff together and kind of push forward and uh, the petty things like you know wars and uh, you know mutually assured destruction was put aside and and we'd focus on science and kind of evolving ourselves as, as a race um, and, and then this idea of exploration this this, this quest to find more uh, really resonated with me and I mean as a kid you know the shuttle program was launching, was not launching, was in full swing. So we'd see a sh shuttle launch like every year or so. And this, you know, this idea that that would kind of go forward and become this tool to explore was really cool. And, and just the idea that we, you know, I, I think people will flag on Star Trek for this idea that, oh, everyone gets along. They don't get along all the time. But this idea that there's some harmony that's been reached is really appealing. I love that answer. Um, well, do you do, do you do the conventions at all with uh, your job? Well, the I do a lot of comic, con comic conventions mostly. I mean, I probably won't for a while, but uh, I've never done Star Trek con, which is uh, a regret, but you know, hopefully in the future. What, what appeals to you about going to these comic conventions and how do you see that change? I think the appeal of these comic cons uh, in that, you know, I've I've been as a fan, I've been as a reporter, I've been as a, you know, a staffer at a comic book publisher. It's it's really, these are the hardcore people. These are the people that live and breathe the source material, whether it's comics or Star Wars or Star Trek or any kind of fandom. These, these people are coming and really want to engage with like-minded fans. They want to engage with the talent that create the stories that resonate with them. You know, these things that they feel like to the bone. Um, and they want to engage with the world. You know, you see the cosplay, you see, you know, the, you know, fan fiction is so big and just the idea that you can be a little part of this bigger story, uh, I think is why people get pulled in. And also there's the memorabilia and collect, you know, collectibles, especially in the comic book space, people, you know, a big chunk of the people going to these conventions want to buy comics and engage with retailers. But I think for the most part, and to speak more generally, it's about a fan wanting to connect with the source material in some way, whether it's meeting an actor who played a favorite character or the writer of a favorite book or a comic book or the artist and, and have that celebrity moment, uh, even though to maybe people outside of that fandom, these people aren't celebrities, but they are to the hardcores. That's really cool. Um, so you've written, Archie comics. Uh, mm -hmm. Good example is um, Archie meets Rock Lobster. I joke, it's the B-52s. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, how did you get involved writing those and um, why the cool crossovers, especially with music? Uh, I was working, I, I work, still work at Archie, but I was, I had just started at Archie doing publicity and I'd written kind of a one-off issue where Archie ironically goes to Comic-Con and uh, Jughead is dressed up not literally as Spock, but in a very Spock-like cosplay. And, and that went over well. And I remember sitting in my boss's office and he said, you know, Gene Simmons has reached out to us and he wants to do Archie Meets Kiss. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of wrapping my head around that. And I just blurted out, well, I can write it. You know, I'll do it. Um, and that really got the ball rolling because it was a four-issue series. Uh, it did really well. I mean, Kiss are very out of this world, you know, beyond just their characters, not just rock stars. And so 
the fan kiss fans seem to like it and comic fans seem to like it so it 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 um it really hit those two audiences and so that really sprung this idea that archie could interact with these rock bands and at the same time archie was changing its evol- it was evolving into more you know varied stories like archie in a zombie apocalypse or archie um meeting different ip like sharknado or or things like that and so people became more comfortable with this idea that archie could be this flexible idea as opposed to just the funny sitcom stories that people grew up on and and then we did ramones which did really well and then we did a book called the archies which followed the band in a more serialized way and each issue featured a new real world band so you had churches you had the monkeys you had blondie Tegan and Sarah, a bunch of different groups. Um, and then we did the B-52s this year, which which worked really well. And I, and I think now it's kind of become like this touchstone. Like now bands reach out to us and say, can we do Archie Meets My Band? And it's, it's really cool that it's become this kind of cultural touch point. I'd love to see him meet you too, just for the record. Uh- <laughs> uh, I almost, you know, I was really close to getting Archie Meets Star Trek. I may try to revisit that at some point. It was... It was, you know, I think IDW, and now we're now I'm off the record, but <laughs> if that's okay, but I, I think we were really close, and uh, that would be very cool. Oh, I'd love to see that. They've done uh, crossovers in the comics with even Planet of the Apes. Yeah, I um, feel like they should be up for it. I mean, I, I'll maybe well, I don't see again. why not. Yeah, no, I'd yeah. love to see that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so how did you get to a gig writing a Poe Dameron novel? You know, that came about um, the head of Lucasfilm Publishing, Mike Siglane, uh, and I have, we've been friends for a long time, and we've always kept in touch, and I announced that I was ending my PI series, my uh, crime novel series, which is set in Miami, where I'm from, and it it was ending with five issues, five, five issues, five novels, the fifth novel was going to be the finale, and so I think Mike picked up on that, and he reached out and said, would you consider doing some Star Wars? I, of course, said yes. You know, I'm a fan. I grew up on Star Wars and Star Trek and a bunch of comics. I was a pop cult, always been a pop culture consumer. Um, I, and I really didn't, hadn't wrapped my head around what he was asking. I thought he meant just, I thought he was just being polite, honestly. I thought he was just <laughs> reaching out and, and just kind of gauging my interest. And then it became, you know, we have this opportunity. It's very much kind of in tune with your aesthetic. It's, it's, and the Poe book is very much a crime novel in space. It's a heist book. There's some double crosses. There's a lot of, a lot of the darker side of the Star Wars universe in terms of shady characters and crime and, and corruption. And, and Poe is kind of the shining light in that. Um, and so it came together fast. And uh, I did my crash course on, on certain things that I, I knew as a fan. But, you know, as a writer, you have to be a little bit more immersed in the subject matter. So I, I dove into that. And it was fun. I mean, I can't. If that's work, then I'm, I'll take it. You know, it didn't feel like work at all. Um, and here we are. Well, I'm looking forward to reading it, even though I have to say personally, I don't think the character is all that interesting. But oh, really? I want to see, <laughs> I want to see your spin on it because you make it well, sound more interesting. It. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, whoever to contact, let me know. <laughs> I got um, I'll get send you the NetGalley link. Oh, cool! Thank you. I'd love that. Yeah, yeah it's up there for sure. Um, so why did you end Pete Fernandez with five books? You know, in terms of PI series, the ones I really loved were the ones that pushed the character forward with each book, you know, like uh, the Nick Stefano's books by George Pelicanos, Laura Lipman's books. Um, and it just felt like each book was a new season if you, if the, if the book series was a show. Um, and there's also this moment of kind of plausible you know, your plausibility going out the window. So you can only, I feel like you can only put the, put your characters through so much before the reader just assumes, okay, you know, this character is invincible. And I, I'm now just reading the series for the kind of episodic value. And, and those, the books were never about that. They were never kind of like law and order. They were not, they were much more about the character and less about, though the cases were interesting to me and really whatever I was obsessing about at the time, it was much more about what is Pete's struggle and how is he getting to this point? Um, and I was really interested in telling the origin story of a private eye, how, how someone can go from a complete mess to becoming, basically becoming Marlowe in some way, you know, becoming that defined PI. 
So without spoiling too much, I, I, w- I knew we were inching towards that point where, okay, he's kind of got his, his, his life together. He's starting to work towards this path. And um, I really felt like I told the stories I wanted to tell from this arc. And um, it just felt like a good breaking point. And uh, I know a lot of people, what really got to me was when I did announce it was ending and I said, you know, Miami Midnight is the last one. I was in my own head, you know, I just decided unilaterally, this is the end. And I hadn't really considered that there were a lot of people that were riding along with Pete this whole time. So the blowback, I wouldn't call it blowback, actually, the reaction was very heartening. And it reminded me that people were reading because I had a lot of people emailing and saying, you know, how could you like Pete is so important, you know, so special. And I really want to know what he's doing. And, you know, just fandom, you know, people are fans, and they're invested in the character. And it reminded me that I wasn't writing in a vacuum, so that was cool. And and who knows, maybe I'll come back at some point. But at this at this moment, I think I want to try some other stuff. And I think it'll be good to give him a break. I mean, the guy deserves a break. <laughs> well, hopefully you'll follow up at some point with him because, as you said, there's people out there who want to know what he's doing. Um, you look at Harlan yeah. Coben, for example, and his Myron Bolotar, he took a break for like 15 years between books. But yeah, yeah, it, yeah. And Dennis Lehane, and I, I love the Pat and Angie books. And I was a fan, and, and I read Moonlight Mile when it came out. And, um, you know, you can go back to it if there's a story to tell. Uh, so I'm curious, what is your favorite series of Star Trek? And what is your favorite episode of that series? Huh. That's a great question. Uh, my favorite series, I think the crew that I, you know, res- you know, that resonates with me the most is the original series. Um, and I-, I treat the original series show separately from the movies, not in a bad way. I feel like the movies are just totally a little different um, and kind of have to exist as a reaction to the show. And I can get into that a little more, I guess. But I think my favorite episode has to be Amok Time, which to me is the beginning of Spock and Kirk going from just officers on the ship to being like brothers, basically, you know, the emotional resonance and just, that's when, to me, that's when Star Trek started to hit on all cylinders. That second season, you know, with Gene Kuhn kind of coordinating the stories and Roddenberry's big ideas getting polished into something a little more character driven um, and less esoteric. And I haven't watched all the episodes in a long time, but obviously they were a big part of my childhood and and much later. But to me, that was the turning point where it went from really good to great for a long time. Um, Yeah, I mean, I could probably do it for every series. I mean, TNG is a very close second and and I have a lot of fondness for Deep Space Nine. And um, those are my top three. I cheated and gave you two more. (laughs) That's right. So you mentioned something about the difference between what you see as the series in the films could you elaborate a little bit on that yeah i think you know you you can't it's really challenging to go into the original series movies without having an affinity for the show a lot of the arc and a lot of the, the heart of those movies is built on this affection for these characters which i think is a great benefit you go in with this built-in audience but it's it's a little harder to grasp as just a casual fan. I think Wrath of Khan is a good example. And actually, the motion picture is a great example because maybe it's an example that wasn't executed as well because it's built so much on these moments, like the, you know, the interminable scene of Kirk on the shuttlecraft watching the Enterprise. I remember watching it as a fan and loving it. And I think a lot of critics who maybe weren't fans of the show watched that scene and groan because it's just Kirk watching the ship. But if you have that built-in emotion about the show, it's fine. I enjoyed it. Or the moment where, you know, the uh, the big three are reunited when we see Spock, McCoy, and Kirk together again. Even though the motion picture gets a lot of grief, um, that moment was cool to me as a fan. And Wrath of Khan, the weight of that movie is so much heavier and so much more impactful because you know these characters. You know, the, the, the themes that Nick Mayer weaves into the movie about aging and, and friendship and letting things go. They, they wouldn't resonate as much if it was a sci-fi movie that just pulled you in and you just met the characters in that moment. I think you have to have, I don't, I don't think baggage is the right term. I think history, you have to have that texture with those characters to really feel that impact. 
And of course, that final scene or those final scenes with Spock and Kirk in engineering, you know, if you didn't know those characters before, it would have been much harder to get the impact of that moment. No, I, I totally agree with you. Um, and one thing that frustrated me about the relaunch, um, the second mm -hmm. movie was a con movie and it just reversed that role and then they cheated. Yeah. I was a little yeah. disappointed with that. Um, yeah, and uh, let's just yeah, say I when mean, I asked Nick Meyer about that, he was like, I don't want to talk about that movie. Like, I got you. <laughs> yeah, I really loved his book, you know, uh, Stories from the Bridge or Tales from the Bridge. I thought it was so, he's such a great writer. But yeah, I mean, the Kelvin timeline stuff is really entertaining from like a pop event movie kind of vibe, like big blockbuster idea. But um, as a fan, I felt shortchanged because you know, and then this is such a common fan gripe, like, oh, you negated all my stories. And I realize that they still exist in other ways. Um, but it did, it did feel like you were being asked to buy into these characters based on stuff that happened before, but then they did, it didn't really happen. And so I think there's so much to Star Trek as a concept in, as a TV series. Like you have these, you get these one-off episodes or like in Next Generation, you get the holodeck episodes or little like, detours that build character and then um, it's much harder as a series of movies which is why i think maybe the this, this new iteration found found itself challenged especially after three like you want to kind of get into the weeds with these characters a bit more i thought the third one nailed the characters that i remembered perfectly yeah the story that was the one was i enjoyed weak. the most yeah yep. i enjoyed beyond a lot more than i thought i would but um you finally had some momentum, but yeah, it just I don't I don't think it resonated beyond that. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so, who are your top two favorite characters? Wow, top two favorite characters. Um, it has to be Kirk and Spock. I mean, it's such an easy choice. I like guess such a common choice, but to me. Uh, you know, Spock is such a complicated figure and, 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 you know, despite his efforts to be emotionless and more Vulcan, his humanity is kind of what makes him so compelling. The fact that, you know, underneath this veneer of stoicism, he is actually a very loyal friend and very emotional. You know, those moments where Spock chooses emotion over logic as a friend, you know, just to either save the crew or to do something, you know, I guess the best example is the scene we, we, we touched on before, which is the end of Wrath of Khan, where, you know, you know, the needs of the many outweighed the needs of the few or the one. Like, that is logical, but I don't think he would have, you know, I think that was much more his friendship and emotion driving him than, than just pure logic. Um, and for me, it's, and the other one, Kirk, obviously, is just such a swashbuckling hero but also one that as, as you continue to follow his story through the movies, you know, you see him evolve and become a little bit, I wouldn't say cautious, but less of, less of this kind of action hero and much more of this seasoned vet and uh, just the great, this prototypical like emotional leader. Um, and, you know, the Trinity isn't complete without bones. You know, you have this kind of like three points of the triangle, like emotion, logic, and heart. I like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, I always loved Scotty too, but uh, I always felt like they didn't do enough with him. Yeah, I feel like, you know, I think there's a much wider gap between the, I guess, executives and the more entry level crew members on TOS and TNG. I mean, Next Generation had so much more runway that they could spend time with, with other characters, whereas I think the original series just focused Kirk on Kirk, Spock, and McCoy almost exclusively. And you got little snippets of Uhura and, and Sulu and, and Chekhov, but those were the characters that really got a lot of uh, airtime in the other media, like in the comics and in, in the, the novelization. Yeah, that's true. Um, so what do you see as the future of Star Trek? And also, why do you believe it's endured for so long? What do I see as the future? I think the success of shows like Discovery and Picard, two shows that are very different and kind of hit different different fan bases in Star Trek, is going are, are going to keep you know that channel going. Not literally the channel of CBS, but the channel of, of TV for you know a, a medium for Star Trek. I think people were reminded that okay, this is where it started and this is where it's worked worked well in the past. 
I think there was that long kind of recovery period after enterprise didn't really set the world on fire. And then the movies happened and, and you had these two companies that had to split rights. So that caused the natural divide. But I think having them, you know, the rights under one umbrella, you know, now that the companies have merged, you'll see a lot more synergy between the films and, and, and the TV, which is what you need, um, you know, in this day where it's like all about multi-platform and different, different takes and, you know, creating these multimedia empires. But um, I think, I think Star Trek resonates as serialized storytelling, but it doesn't have to be my, I think my one gripe, as much as I love Picard, I think my one gripe is that there were no little detours, you know, it was very, a very tight 10 episode series and there weren't any kind of character moments. Like we didn't have a, a Raffi episode where we, we kind of just explored her or had her do like a, a side story. Um, so I think hopefully they'll, they'll see more of that, but I, I do think you'll have more synergy between the two streams of like television and, and movies. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a good renaissance period for Star Trek these days, which is nice to see because there were uh, that, those doldrum periods between Enterprise and, and the first, uh, I guess, J.J. Abrams Star Trek movie were seemed interminable, I thought. And there was another question there that I think I totally whiffed on. Oh, um, why do you believe it's endured for so long? I think it's endured because of this idea of a hopeful future. I think people really connect with that. And, uh, you know, I think there are two, two guiding points in sci-fi. There's sometimes there's, a, you know, the dark post-apocalyptic and really nihilistic kind of take where it's, it's somebody trying to overcome really existing, not great, <laughs> uh, a not great situation. And then there's a more utopian view, but this, this, it's a little less utopian, you know, things are good and, but they can go bad. And so that idea that we're always striving to do better, I mean, that's kind of, I just rewatched it recently, but that's kind of the gist of Encounter at Farpoint. Um, you know, humanity has moved beyond its savage nature, but it has to continue to strive and to do what's best and do the right thing and, and kind of overcome itself. And I think that's very relatable on a human level, but also, also on a societal level. And, um, you know, Star Trek's always had a sense of humor, which I appreciate. You know, those there are episodes sometimes that are just, you know, just funny, and that's okay. And I and I think you have to kind of laugh at yourself to really succeed, or to you know to really be human. And uh, so it, it's that struggle on on macro level, but it's also I think the best Star Trek series have a character struggle where it's a character striving to either be more human or kind of connect with humanity in a way that we can all relate to like whether it's data or spock or tuvok or you know odo there's always that linchpin character that is really striving to connect to the greater world and i, I think that's such a human thing i love that answer thank you oh, cool. um do you know by heart space the final frontier that that speech i can try it and go for it uh yeah, I mean, I know the differences. I mean, I know, okay, space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the starship Enterprise. Its mission, to seek out new life and new civilizations. And to, did I, there's another line there that I whiffed on. To boldly go where no man has gone before. That, that's totally cool. Um, that part you whiffed on is the one people seem to forget. So it's, it's kind of funny. But what thank you for doing um, okay. Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. It's oh, continuing seek mission. New life, a new, yeah. Seek out new life and new civilization and to boldly go where no man has gone before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, okay. so I feel, I feel less bad about bombing. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> Can you give me a live long and prosper? Live long and prosper. Absolutely love it. Thank you very much. Cool. Uh, I will stop here for...